Hello, welcome to a webinar looking at four classic investment strategies. My name is Dan Coatesworth and thank you ever so much for joining me today. So a quick disclaimer as we prepare to start the webcast. So just remember that the value of your investments can go down as well as up and you might get back less than you originally invested. We don't offer advice, so it's important that you understand the risks. So if you're unsure, please do consult a suitably qualified financial advisor. Tax treatment depends on your individual circumstances and rules may change. And past performance is not a guide to future performance and some investments need to be held for the long term. So today I'm going to be talking about quality, value, income, and momentum investing. I'll explain what each of these strategies means, um, how you can go about finding relevant investment opportunities. And also for each one, I'll, I'll give you some examples of stocks, funds, investment trusts. And finally, there will be a question and answer session at the end. And I'll, I'll go through as many of the questions as possible that have been sent in. Um, in about an hour, after this webinar ends, you should receive um, a survey email um, come through. So just check your, your junk box in your email um, just in case it's hiding in there. Um, but within that survey email, there will be a chance to, for you to ask um, any further questions if there's something you want clarified from today's presentation. Um, so now let's, let's just crack on with the first one. So I'll talk to you about quality investing. So investment trust, Fundsmith Equity, Evenload Income and Global Income, uh, Linzel Train Global Equity and Artemis's Midwind. Now these are all funds that use the quality investment process and you know, they've all been outperforming the market. I'll just give you some examples. Midwind has just hit a new all-time share price high. Linzel Train Global Equity has achieved 302% total return since it launched in March 2011. Now that's compared with 173% from the MSCI World Index, which is like an index of companies around the world and is sort of a classic um, stock market benchmark. So these figures sort of indicate that quality investment strategy can generate good returns. Of course, that's as long as the investor is picking great stocks. So the theory with quality investing is that investing in high quality companies will generate above average returns over time. So the fund manager Nick Train from Linzel Train says that excellent companies tend to create great wealth for their patient owners over time. So for this strategy, you want to focus on companies that are doing well and can keep doing well. So really it's all to do with the sustainability of success. Now, no one can predict exactly if a company will continue to thrive, but you can see who's best positioned to do so by looking at some various characteristics. Just give you some examples now. So pricing power is one of them. So this is the ability to put up prices without causing a negative impact on demand. A company should really have a competitive moat. So if you think how a moat around a castle provides protection from intruders, a company can also have a moat to protect it from competitors stealing its lunch. Just think of Google, its search engine power. Now rivals haven't really been able to beat Google here. I don't know if you, you might remember the, the company Ask Jeeves years ago, tried its best to, to become sort of the dominant player in search, but it just couldn't overcome Google's rapid ascent. So Google's now got 92% of the market. And in second place is Bing at just 2.6%. And actually, ironically, the, the, sort of the, the top search query on Bing is actually Google. Imagine these are people who've been given a work laptop, perhaps, and it's got Bing pre-installed as the the search engine to use and actually what they really want to do is, is you know, find their way onto Google and they can they can do search the way they want to. Other things to consider with quality investment in terms of characteristics of companies would be balance sheet strength. This is looking at a company's assets and liabilities. 
So here you want to see low debt, lots of cash and control over its working capital. I'd also look for high levels of profitability and that companies are honest with their accounting. So how do you go about finding quality companies? So I think as an investor, you've got several ways to go about doing it. One might be to look at funds that have a quality tilt. So you can either invest directly in these funds. We might actually just want to look at their the holdings in their portfolios to give you some ideas. And there are other ways you can spot companies, which I'll come to in a second. But first, let's, if we just stick with the funds theme, now, funds theme with equity is probably the UK's most popular fund, arguably. Um, delivered more than twice the returns of the broader market since it launched in November 2010. So it's achieved 402% versus 186% from the MSCI World Index over that period. So Fundsmith Equity invests in companies for the long term. It doesn't really trade in and out of stuff very often. So I don't know if you, you, if you haven't read it before. It's well worth checking out. There's an owner's manual on its website which explains how it finds quality companies and what, and perhaps importantly, what it wouldn't invest in. So the fund's done very well this year and longer term. So this year in particular, it's, it's really benefited from having strong exposure to consumer staples and technology. Both seem to be quite resilient at the moment. And it's also done well because of what it doesn't own as well. So says it would never hold airlines or oil companies or banks. So by doing so, it's really avoided some of the worst parts of the market in 2020. So if you were looking through its portfolio for suggestions of names that it thinks meet the quality investment criteria, um, holdings include Microsoft, PayPal, and the US spices group McCormick. Now there is another product which uses the same investment strategy, which is also run by the Fundsmith Asset Management business. This is an investment trust called Smithson. So this is investing in sort of mid cap companies. So it follows exactly the same process, um, but it, it is run by different people uh, in terms of just the day to day fund management but, um, to Fundsmith Equity. Um, but they're all part of the same business. So Smithsman's um, holdings include the American data business Verisk Analytics, 3D design software group Ansys, and Cognex, which makes sensors for factory automation. So just more examples of funds with a quality bias um, would include the funds that are offered by the asset management firm Linzel Train. So Linzel Train invests in companies which it thinks have got brands or franchises, a great durability and value. So you, you might find names like Manchester United Football Club in there or Unilever and AG Bar. So Linzel Train's got quite a few different funds and they include Linzel Train UK, there's a global version, a Japanese one, and one of its investment trusts is called Finsbury Growth and Income. Evenload is another um, highly respected quality investor. Um, so it's got a couple of income funds and it looks for companies that have got high return on capital and strong free cash flow. So essentially that means companies which generate great returns from the money that they invest in their business. And when we talk about free cash flow, it's the money generated from operations and it's left over after paying for stuff to keep the business competitive. So it's the free cash flow that's used to pay dividends, to make acquisitions, and to help pay down any debt a business might have. So if you go rifling through even those portfolios for some ideas, you'll find the auction house eBay, the accounting software business Sage, and Purcell washing powder maker make Henkel. So if you don't want to buy a fund uh, with a quality tilt, you don't really want to look through the portfolio. Another way you might find individual stocks would be to use a stock screener. Um, so here, this is like a, a system which you, you can go onto various sort of financial 
um, websites and you, you sort of punch in a criteria um, and then they'll give you a list at the end of it of everything that sort of ticks the box. Uh, now, finding quality stocks isn't simply a case of just having the right criteria and buying whatever's on the list. You must do some more digging into each company. So you've got to consider them on their own merits, not simply because they, they appear on this screen. So I think if you want to find companies with quality characteristics, you really want to look for steady profits and cash flow, high profit margins, high returns on capital employed. And that's also known as ROCE, so R-O-C-E. And you want them to convert high levels of profit into free cash flow. So if you have access to a stock screening system, I suggest you want to punch in these criteria. So look for lease adjusted return on capital employed of at least 15%, a 10 year average Rocky, as that's the return on capital employed of at least 15% again. Um, the current EBIT margin, which is the earnings before interest and tax, at least 15%. And really it's got to convert at least 80% of post-tax profit into free cash flow. So if you look at your screen now, you'll see a list of companies that sort of tick the box. So what I've done is to use a stock screening system provided by SharePad. Now there are other stock screeners available in the market. I just happen to use this one. Um, it's one that I personally use in my in my day to day research of companies. Now, if we, if, we, if you punch in the criteria I just discussed, it brings up 46 stocks on the UK stock market. Now, some of you might know some of these names like the big mining company BHP, the comparison website Money Supermarket. There's probably a few on there which I think some of you might be less familiar with like the air conditioning group Andrews Sykes and the lighting system specialist F.W. Thorpe. Now it's interesting to note that some of these companies aren't delivering positive returns for investors every year. Now, I must emphasize that even with quality investing strategy, you've got to be patient and really take a long term view on stuff. Now, if you look at Money Supermarket, yes, it's on this list. It, um, it may not be on your screen, but it, on the on the longer list of all the ones, I just couldn't fit everything on the screen to, to show you. But um, of this list of 46 stocks, Money Supermarket's there, and it has achieved a 56% return in 2015. I mean, that, that's fantastic. But actually in the following year, it lost 19%. Three out of five recent years for plus 500 were awful. But the good years were outstanding, including in 2017 alone, it made 130% return. So other names that appear on the quality filter include safety products group Halma, the patent translation expert RWS, and the construction equipment rental business Ashted. So I've looked at the total return which is the share price and the dividends for the five years until the 20th of February 2020. So the reason why I've taken that day is essentially that's the day before the UK market really started its sort of coronavirus um, triggered sell off. So I wanted to look at a five year period which was um, uninterrupted by the current pandemic just to give you a view of what how things might perform under normal circumstances. So of those 46 stocks, 38 of them had beaten the FTSE All Shares 35% gain over that time period, which is very impressive. So I must stress, we've already mentioned at the start in a disclaimer, but, but you know, past performance isn't sort of a guide to how things will perform in the future. But I think it is worth noting um, just the trends that we're seeing. So 27%. 27 of the 46 stocks delivered more than twice the return of the market over that time period. So on your screen, I mentioned I couldn't fit everything in, but I'm just showing you the, the top 25 by total return for those five years. So I don't know if any of you are, are, are sort of 
desperately trying to scribble down names or anything that you're seeing on your screen, don't worry because you'll be able to watch this webinar again. Um, we'll, we'll make it um, live on the AJ Bell U Invest website very soon and you can watch it again at your leisure. So, so don't worry about scribbling everything down. You can always go back and re-watch it at your leisure. So many of the stocks that fit the criteria for quality investing will probably trade on high valuations. So essentially, you need to be prepared to pay a premium to own some of them. And you must consider that a company's success isn't guaranteed forever. So for example, many analysts are worried about right move at the moment and how a lot of its estate agent customers are unhappy with having to pay very high fees. There's actually a bit of a backlash growing against the company. And if you saw its recent trading update, you'll see that its membership numbers have fallen by nearly 4% this year. Now, also on our, our list on the screen, you'll see Intercontinental Hotels. So, I mean, this is, um, they own things like Holiday Inns and um, lots of hotels around the world. But actually, if you were trying to weigh up, is this something I want to look at at the moment? I think you'd need to have some sort of view about what's happening with the state of the hotels industry. You know, if we're going to be lots more people working from home, does that mean it's going to be a lot less business travel? I mean, surely as a hotel company, it might feel some pain. So th these are sort of the questions you need to be thinking about um, when you're doing your research. You know, just do, do not simply buy something because it just ticks the box on our stock screener. So if we have a look now at value investing. So this is about finding something that's trading below its intrinsic value. Really what you want to do is to find a stock where if there's any problems, those problems might be fixed soon. And if there's a negative perception by the market towards it, well, you think that then something might happen for the market to, to reappraise it. And of course that will drive a re-rating. And ideally what you want to do is buy cheap and sell it when it reverts back to fair value. Now value has struggled for ages as a style because the market's been obsessed with paying high multiples for companies who are growing earnings. People haven't really wanted to own companies that need to fix problems. So a lot of value stocks are cheap for a reason. And really, as an investor, it's about finding the ones that aren't going to stay cheap forever. You know, value goes in and out of fashion, but it can be successful. So on your screen, you'll see a comparison of um, different parts of the S&P 500 market in the US. So the standard market alone, the composite of it, um, over 10 years returned 200%. Now, a growth version, you know, just looking at growing companies here, much better at 280%. But actually, if you look at the value um, stocks that sit in the S&P 500, that index is still up 127% over 10 years. I mean, that is still, still very good. You know, it's better than what you get with cash in the bank, certainly in, uh, in recent history. So I just want to emphasize that, you know, value investing is not in fashion at the moment, but that doesn't mean to say it's a broken investment strategy. Buffett's, uh, do you know Warren Buffett is, is one of the world's most famous investors and he's a value investor through and through. His mentor, Benjamin Graham, set the standard for value investing. And he looked for companies with a good credit rating, a low ratio of debt to assets, ones that pay dividends and he really wanted to be buying them on less than 10 times earnings. So his model would be to buy and hold in the expectation that other investors would eventually discover them and bid up the price to fair value. So there's an argument that value outperforms growth style investments when economic growth is strong and persistent, when inflation is rising and when the stock market has been going up. So in this environment, investors would arguably focus less on the growth rates of a company because almost all companies could be growing and instead they focus on valuation. But when 
economic growth is weak. Investors tend to focus on companies that are growing and they pay less attention to valuation. So on that basis, you may come to the conclusion that value is not going to do well at the moment, given that the pandemic has cast a big cloud over the economic outlook. However, value often outperforms as economies shift back from recession to growth. Remember that the stock market's forward-looking and a lot of the value stocks have actually been picking up in recent months, such as airlines and some of the oil companies. So it could well be that you know, we've seen value come back into fashion. We don't know how long it will last. And, or is it that the market's simply getting ahead of itself? We haven't actually had this recession yet that everyone's expecting to be caused by the pandemic. So I, I'd actually suggest that a good diversified investment portfolio should have a bit of exposure to both value and quality or you know, growth is probably another way of um, saying it. A lot of people sort of intertwine. They talk about quality and growth being the same things, but arguably they, they're slightly different because you can have a growing company that's not not a quality company, but if saying it rather than trying to time the market, it's probably worth having multiple investment styles across your holdings. You may want to actually play around with the weightings, um, not have them equally weighted. So at the moment, if quality is in favour, you may want to have a, a much bigger weighting towards value. But I wouldn't I wouldn't ignore value entirely simply because it's sort of it lagging quality in terms of performance. So how do you go about finding investment ideas? So if I take the same format as I did with a quality style, so I'll, I'll, if you can either look at value funds, look in their portfolios for ideas, or we could do a bit of stock screening. So I'll, I'll talk you through each one of those now. So on your screen, you'll see um, a slide for Fidelity Special Values. So this is run by Alex Wright, who looks for companies that others just aren't interested in generally because there might be some short-term issue with them. So he puts them into three buckets. So first of all, we've got companies that are just beginning their period of change. Um, secondly, it's ones where the market's starting to recognise some of that change. And then thirdly, where the change is arguably fully priced in by the market. So in the first bucket, there's stocks like Royal Dutch Shell and BP. So these are two big oil companies who have to adapt to uh, what is inevitably going to be a more renewable energy world. And they're also having to deal with a very low oil price at the moment. A lot of change will be going on within those businesses. And also on the list, you can see there's Aviva, um, which has got a relatively new boss who's trying to revitalise growth. Um, you know, so look at the second bucket there. It's got uh, stocks like Serco, which is getting back on track after a long period of problems. And also there's Megit there, which is a defence and aeroplace supplier. So Wright's view is that irrespective of airline profitability, if we're starting to see planes get back in the sky, then Megit should get some aftermarket business for its aerospace operations. So on those third bucket of uh, stocks, I, I'd probably argue that they're, they're probably near the end of their days inside this Fidelity portfolio. Because if, you know, if they're talking about they've already been priced in, that would suggest the shares have already re-rated. So you can see some names there, like the Defence Group Ultra Electronics as tech business cohort in there as well. So other examples of value funds include MAN GLG undervalued assets. It had a great 2017 returning 30% versus just 13% from the FTSE All Share. And that really goes to show that value funds can do well, even though the style is out of favour. But you know, unfortunately, it's underperformed this year. But you, know, you need to look at longer term track records when, when judging funds. If you're looking for ideas by digging around its portfolio, you might find names like the house builder Red Row. Um, the tobacco group Imperial Brands is in there. And there's a real estate group called St. Modwin Properties. So classic valuation metrics that you can use 
to find stocks if you don't want to buy a fund uh, you can you can use things like price to earnings price to earnings growth which is also known as peg and price to book now there's a slight problem at the moment is that earnings forecast aren't entirely reliable because there's still a lot of companies who are trying to quantify the impact of COVID-19 on their business and that means analysts have sort of got a very wide range of forecasts of businesses quite a lot of them that companies themselves have actually withdrawn their own guidance at the moment but um, so something to consider at the moment but if, if you were to use classic valuation metrics this is how you'd go about it so price to earnings the p multiple is probably the most classic uh value valuation metric of them all so here, here you would take the latest share price and divide it by how much earnings a company is expected to make in the future so so really I, I, as a rough guide i'd say anything below a figure of 12 would highlight companies that aren't growing fast or they might have financial problems or they might just be misunderstood by the market so your your sort of challenge is to dig around and try and work out is is there any companies in there which um something is happening to them or something soon something could there's a strategy in place to try and fix things and um or the, you know they're they're tapping into a structural growth trend for example um it, it's you know with value investing there's a lot of fishing around um i imagine you, you know you might have to put quite a bit of work into this to find opportunities but you know hey if it was going to be so easy we'd all be rich wouldn't we so um so back on to p now if you're looking at a number between 12 and 18 um it probably fair value depending on the nature of its business and its growth prospects um a figure of 19 now that might be 19 or above that might be because a company could just be growing fast the market tends to ascribe quite high multiples for for really fast growth businesses um, it might be perceived to be high quality like I say the market's happy to pay up for for good quality businesses or it just might simply be overpriced other valuation metrics so peg which is the price to earnings growth um, here you want to try and find a number below one because that would imply that the company is undervalued against its growth prospects and the price to book or pb this compares the share price with the book value of a company's assets again you want to look for a figure below one to see if something's considered to be cheap now you can get earnings forecasts free of charge from reuters website and that's fine if you've you've already got a list of stocks that you're interested in you know what you're looking for but actually, if you just want to be given a list of companies which are cheap, um, well, go and use the stock screening system to get that initial list. So I mentioned earlier that I used SharePad for the previous example. You could use that or you could, uh, Stockopedia is another popular example. Now you probably need to pay a fee to use them, but these stock screeners, I think most of them should have a free trial period if you want to test their systems. So let's take a look at now at some stocks that screen as being cheap because uh, based on certain of these valuation metrics so being a value investor sometimes involves going against the grain and looking at stuff that might not seem initially very exciting uh, so I, I had a look for stocks that are trading on a one and two year forward p of between five and twenty so I think anything under five is is sort of perhaps danger territory, really you know, cheap for a very obvious negative reason. So I looked between five and twenty, and, and one that jumped out from the list was Epwin. And this is a small cap business. It makes PVC windows and doors. So you, know, you have a look at its financial position. It doesn't look too bad, and you know its operations are back up and running after a brief COVID shutdown. But what? interests me is the fact that so many people have been at home at the moment and you know if you're staring at your walls all day long and, and just confined to your home you're probably thinking what you know what can i do to make it look better um, and you know, we've seen lots of stories on the news about people queuing up to to get into places like b and q to do stuff get equipment for diy and i also think lots of um 
people are going to be looking at their homes and thinking, how am I going to make it look nice? And so therefore, you know, theoretically, Epwin could see a bounce back in demand from people wanting to replace windows and doors. You know, there's no guarantee, but I think with a P of just 6.2 times forecast earnings, that it suggests the market's already discounting a lot of bad news. So you know, next time it's got a trading update, I shall certainly be looking very closely to see what it thinks about state of current trading. Um, on the priced earnings growth or the PEG, um, the one that caught my eye was the gold miner Hummingbird. It's on a, it's on a PEG of just 0 0.3. So that implies it's very cheap compared to its potential earnings outlook. It's got a producing gold mine in Mali and an exploration asset in Liberia. So it is generating revenue, which is not always the case with many smaller companies in the mining sector on the stock market. So it's, it recently signed up this heads of terms agreement to buy uh, a gold mine called Carusa in Guinea. Now this is a near term development asset with more than a million ounces of gold in the ground. Um, the grades look pretty good as well, just above three grams per ton. So as a business, Hummingbird has had some operational issues and flag cost pressure. So you could think, okay, there's, there's your bits of bad news which are being priced in by the market. But actually, what, when you have a gold miner who's launched an, a mine, inevitably they will have borrowed money to do that. And really what they want to be doing is generating solid levels of cash to, to pay down that debt. And that's exactly what Hummingbird is doing. It's, it's generating this cash, um, you know, debt is going down and actually adding this Carusa mine in Guinea could see it have two producing mines in the next two or three years. So it'd be diversifying its revenue stream. Um, and it's also busy with exploration as well, trying to find more material to help extend the life of its Marley mine. So initially, that there, you know, there's your sort of pros and cons, and that would form a very good basis for someone to then go off and do a bit more detailed research about the business. Um, it's a great example of how you can use the stock screening tools just to throw up that initial idea and use it as a platform for a bit more investigative work. So actually, you know, I, I, I talked about how value investing is, uh, potentially might be in bouncing back into fashion at the moment if we're talking about travel and oil companies bouncing back. But in you know, last August, we did see value become really fashionable, albeit for only a brief moment. And so in that in that time, we saw all the stuff like stocks and funds that had a quality tilt drop in value. So things like rent to kill you know, Fundsmith and Linda Train funds, they all started to dip. And I think, you know, we didn't have a warning we we're going to get this style rotation. And it caught a lot of people off guard, particularly those who are convinced that quality stocks were invincible. So while it didn't really last long, you know, it does show that quality's rally is not bulletproof. So I think if you look back at the three big market crises the last 30 years, 1987, the, the tech bubble and the global financial crisis. You know, in those times, value shares actually did better than growth. Um, you know, and, and within that, obviously, quality would be part of it as the economy picked up. So yes, it, you know, value is a tough place to be. You do have to do a considerable amount of homework. Um, but you know, for, for many investors, this is the place in which they really love to have a look for opportunities. So if we go on to momentum investing. So this is about latching on to a stock in a rising trend. And many actually can keep rising for a long time and often beyond the fair value of a business. So people often keep buying something that's displaying price momentum in the belief that it will keep going up. So I think the easiest way to define to, sorry, to define the investment process is to buy stocks that have delivered high returns over the past three to 12 months. Now it's consistency is key here. You don't really want to buy something that's only risen for a short period. So if we look at uh, the funds space, um, relevant funds that embrace momenting, momentum as a style include Merion North American Equity. And there's also the exchange traded fund or ETF um, called Vanguard Global Momentum Factor. Now that trades on the London stock market and it's got the ticker V 
M-O-M. -M. So I had a look at its top holdings as of the end of March, which was the most recently reported period. Um, the names in there included Next, X, Next Era Energy, uh, Tesla, and Advanced Micro Devices. If you don't fancy buying a fund or don't want to buy an ETF, and to be honest, I think that's, you know, I think a lot of people would probably uh, associate fund investing more with longer term stuff. Well, this is this is probably shorter term activity. Well, it, then if you if your your primary interest is looking for individual stocks yourself, um, I suggest you start by going to a stock screen and looking at three, six and 12 month relative strength figures. So relative strength measures a stock's price change relative to the price change of a market index. So it shows the relative outperformance or underperformance of the stock over a specific time frame. You might also want to look at price versus 12 month high. Um, so many successful trading strategies have shown that stocks breaking out to new highs have a tendency to outperform the market. The point at which you might want to sit up and take notice is when stocks are within 10% of their 12 month high. You know, another strategy as part of the sort of the broader momentum approach is look for price versus 50 and 200 day moving average. Now here, a, a moving average is it's kind of like the average price of a stock over a set period of time. You know, that, that could range from five days to, to six months or even longer. So frequently a chart would show price movements as being quite jumpy. So the moving average smooths out the price movements. It shows a clearer path. And really this technique should help to decipher a stock's trend and to plot out the support and resistance levels. So to give you an idea of what's scoring highly at the moment, um, I've used Stockopedia this time um, as a screener um, and it's got a filter which looks at the price strength relative to the market, um, also looks at technical measures and the proximity of its share to the 52 week high and it looks at earnings forecast revisions, analyst recommendations and earnings surprises. So on your screen you'll see some of the results from the search that I did. So my search found 147 companies and you know, if you've got access to Stockopedia and you want to run this screen at a later date, um, the one I've used is called Top Momentum Rank. So from the list that I ran, the names include computer games company Team17, Mr. Kipling Cakes owner Premier Foods and the drugs company AstraZeneca. So you'll also see some of the biotech stocks that have been in big demand this year, like Open Orphan. It's actually interesting to see Seven Trent on that list as well. So you, you would, I don't think you'd normally associate with a boring old utility with momentum vesting, but you know, they've been in, in demand. You'll also see that Pennon is on the list as well. So it's important to stress these stocks need catalysts to sustain this upwards momentum. So that might be a, a positive trading update or a contract win, something like that. Um, so if, if it's a really highly rated stock, you know, very expensive valuation, here you'd need, um, you need a sign that a business is doing exceptionally well, not simply okay, because the market's all about pricing and expectations and um, they always want to see something doing brilliantly. Yeah, and if, and just okay sometimes doesn't cut the mustard and you might see the shares fall back again. Also watch out for this FOMO factor, this fear of missing out. A lot of people love to buy story stocks that are going up. So the ones that everyone's sort of raving about at the moment. So I think, at the, I think as we're recording this podcast, any company that's talking about trying to help the fight against coronavirus, they've been in big demand this year. Um, and I think some people who've been putting money into those stocks, particularly if they've been buying much earlier this year and they made quite good money on them, they'll probably look for accelerated trading volumes and think that you know if there's a sudden a big rush of interest in them, 
it's a good chance for them to sell out. Liquidity will be good. So just just watch out if something's really hyped up. A good chance that a lot of the easy money will have already been made. So buying late could be a mistake because you you potentially see some of those early adopters getting out. So um, so yeah, momentum investing. I would say it's probably quite a risky strategy. You need to keep a close eye on events and share price behavior. So if you want to put money into the stock market um, and buy and hold, so you, know, you, you develop this portfolio, then you can go off and enjoy you know, your hobbies or, or you know, spending time with your family and stuff and not have to sort of look at a screen constantly and check your investments. I don't think momentum is probably the strategy for you. But if you've got um, time and you, you, you find it all fascinating, keeping a close eye on this on the market, then you, you know you you might find this is quite an interesting approach to um, putting money into stocks. So let's have a look at income investing. Uh, now a lot of people invest their money in the markets specifically to generate an income. I think this particularly applies to people in retirement. You know, here they haven't got salary coming in. So really they want to be living off the dividends or bond coupons from them from their investments and using that cash to, to help pay the bills. So changes to pension rules in 2015 meant that people with a defined contribution pension no longer had to buy an annuity. So instead they could just keep their money invested. That created lots of extra demand for, for stocks that pay decent dividends. And also for funds and investment trusts as well that offered yields greater than what you could get on cash in the bank. So historically, you could have found income opportunities by looking at the yields on offer from individual stocks and running some checks to see how much of their dividends were covered by earnings and cash to see if the payments were sustainable. Or you could use the services of a fund manager who would have done all that hard work for you. Unfortunately, this year, everything seems to have changed with regards to dividends. So hundreds of companies have cut or suspended their payments. They really want to preserve cash through the pandemic. So unfortunately, that's made it much harder to find good dividend paying investments. And even those which look like they're still paying out, they could easily change their mind if things don't, if you know, their earnings don't pick up. You know, we are still seeing companies decide not to pay previously declared dividends. So another issue is that many companies are now likely to use this opportunity to rebase their future dividends at a lower level. I guess there's this argument that UK stocks have been paying out too much to investors and now is probably an opportune time to correct this situation. Just look at BT told its shareholders they're not going to get a dividend for at least 18 months. And when those dividends do restart, they're only going to be at half the level as before. So if you look at uh, fund fact sheets and you're sort of trying to get an idea of what um, various funds, investment trusts and ETFs pay in terms of yield, just be careful because they'll show the historic yield, which is based on how much was paid out in the last financial year. So this isn't really going to be an accurate guide for all investments about what you could get in the coming year. It may well be that funds are generating less income from their portfolio because of some of the companies in their portfolio are, are actually cut their dividends. So um, it just means that they're going to have less money to to pay out to weather. So um, just on your screen, you'll see an example of what it might look like if you if you type in um, the name of an investment trust. Here, I've just got an example of Murray Income Trust, and it's saying at the moment the yield is 4.4%. But um, you know, just take things with a pinch of salt at the moment as to when that's you know, how accurate that that is as an illustration of what you might get. But actually, investment trusts are kind of an exception. Um, to the rule because you know, as, a, as a sort of a, a class of investment they're allowed to hold back up to 15% of their income each year so they can use this to top up any shortfalls in their portfolio to help sustain or even grow dividends in hard times such as now 
So we were just talking about Murray though, you know, th there is a chance it might actually dip into its reserves and, and you could still get that 4.4% yield. But, um, now they won't all do this and there's no guarantee that they'll maintain dividends at the same level, but you know, this, this is called a revenue reserve. It's, it's definitely an advantage of the investment trust format. The AIC, which is the Association of Investment Companies, produces the Investment Trust Dividend Heroes list, which shows trusts with at least 20 years of consecutive dividend growth. So it's kind of a privileged status to be on this list. So I think members are going to do everything they can to keep growing dividends. So the names include City of London Investment Trust, which has 53 years of uninterrupted dividend growth. Bankers Investment Trust, uh, Alliance Trust, they're both on 53 years. Uh, you've got Caledonia Investments on there, 52 years. And BMO Global Smaller Companies on there for 49 consecutive years. So I think if anyone's looking for ideas for income generating investments, don't just simply look at UK equity funds or UK equities as in general. There's lots of other places that could potentially offer decent income. So Asia was the first region into the COVID-19 crisis. It could well be the first one to properly come out. So if you were looking for dividend focused investment trust in the Asia space, um, names would include Aberdeen Asian Income, Schroeder Oriental Income and CC Japan Income and Growth Trust. Some of the parts of the property space look resilient from an income perspective uh, would include those invested in warehouses and social housing. So relevant products here would be primary health properties and Civitas social housing. So infrastructure would be a good source of income. So I think you probably want to look at the moment for funds that invest in essential government backed assets like schools, hospitals or, or critical gas works rather than demand led infrastructure like rail roads and airports. So I think a relevant fund example here would be international public partnerships where most of its investments are in essential services and not demand led ones. So the AIC website will show you the historic yields of investment trusts. If you want to look at funds, uh, you might want to go to Morningstar's website where its fund screener lets you search by specific yield ranges. So it might be between the two and 4% range or, or the four to 6% range. Just remember these are historic yields and not forecasts. Uh, Morningstar system should let you search by sector as well. So let's say I wanted a global equity fund yielding between four and six percent. Well, Morningstar system will tell me there's 17 options I can look at. So it's worth pointing out that there is sort of a slow shift in sectors paying dividends. So, uh, you know, for example, a lot of people have historically relied on the oil and gas sector for generous income, but you know that looks potentially under threat now as the industry is reinventing itself and also is having to stomach a much lower oil price. So instead you're, you're seeing parts of the market paying dividends which historically haven't really been associated with income opportunities. To me the main one that jumps out is technology. I think a lot of people just assume that these are just growth stocks um, but actually you know they're highly cash generative business. Um, you know, if you look at things like the ones that provide software as a service well they're getting this recurring revenue. Um, you know, they should be generating pretty decent cash, particularly for the more mature businesses. And, you know, and here, you know, they should be able to have a growing stream of dividends. So, you know, this is the great thing about tech. You, you should hopefully a good company should give you capital gains each year. And now you've potentially got a growing dividend stream as well. So, so each year you get a bit more in dividends than you did last year. And if you don't need that income, reinvest it and enjoy those compounding benefits. And of course, you can look at the AJ Bell website. We, uh, here we've got uh, a favorite funds list. You just go to um, the funds section and drop your cursor down and click the AJ Bell favorite funds tab. You can click income under the investment goal. I look at the whole range. It's got about 30 products on there at the moment or you narrow it down by sector or asset classes. But if you, if you want to look at stocks uh, for dividends, use a stock screen and look at forecast dividends here. Um, 
So using SharePad, I, I've done some screening. And I've looked for yields between two and eight percent. So two percent is is higher than what you get in cash in the bank. I think eight percent is probably the maximum you you get before you're starting to get into sort of murky territory. Because I think anything above eight percent is the market's way of saying it doesn't really believe the dividend is sustainable. So remember the yields based on the latest share price and the forecast payout. So if his shares are falling and the dividend forecast doesn't change, the yield will go up. And we saw this recently with Imperial Brands, where it was on an 11% yield. Um, you know, the, the share price was falling. The market's clearly sort of saying doesn't believe the dividend sustainable. And yet you saw it, the dividend, first dividend cut in, in, in its history. So I'd, I've just done some searching for income opportunities. And I've looked for free cash flow dividend cover of one or more. And uh, that's saying that it's got the same or more free cash flow than it's paying out in dividends. So trying to make sure that a company can afford to be paying stuff. I think a lot of people look at earnings per share when they when they talk about dividend cover. But really, you know, dividends are funded by cash. I think you're better off looking at free cash flow here. So just a reminder, that's the amount of cash generated from operations minus the money needed to be spent on the business to keep it competitive. Um, you know, I've put a bit of a market cap filter just looking at stuff over 500 million. But, you know, there are companies in the small cap space who do pay dividends. So my search has given me a list of 117 stocks. And on your screen, you should see the top 20 buy yield within the 2 to 8% range. So just, just read latest announcements from any company you're interested in. See if they've updated guidance for dividend payments. Um, from the list I've pulled from SharePad, matching my desired criteria, you can see names on there like the power companies Drax and Contour Global. Um, there's a telecoms group Vodafone and gold miner Sentiment is on there as well. They're on the amongst the sort of the higher payers. Just to, just remember to pick your stocks based on a company's merit, not simply its yield. So finally, I've really haven't really touched on bonds as a source of income, but um, you know, corporate bonds are starting to look a bit more interesting. There's lots of investor appetite to back some really big companies issuing bonds during the pandemic. Um, but government bonds are offering very low yields at the moment. So prices have been bid up as investors flock to safe haven assets. So let's now go to the Q&A section. First of all, I've had a question from someone who's asking, Value investing has been out of favour for quite a while now. Why did it go out of favour and under what conditions could it come back into favour? It's a good question. Yeah, so I think value went out of favour because we've been in a low growth environment for such a long time. Investors were happy to pay up to own companies that were growing earnings by a decent rate. The value space it's underperformed quality, but you know, I'm saying many value fund managers still manage to find stocks that have re-rated. So it hasn't been a wasted space for investors, for you know, for, certainly for some of the the, you know, the best performing value funds. But as for when value investing could become more fashionable, I think you know history sort of suggests in periods of inflation, investors need hard assets like commodities and property. And value areas like cyclicals, financials, and emerging markets. Inflation is low at the moment, but if this situation changes, it'd be well worth watching the value space for investments. So the other thing that could drive more interest in value investing is investors refusing to pay very high earnings multiples for quality stocks. So at the moment, quality is in fashion and stocks have been going up because Investors have been happy to pay high earnings multiples. It's not because the earnings forecasts are going up. So I think there might be a tipping point when people say, actually, the price is now just too high. But fortunately, no one has the answer as to when that will be. OK, another question. So as income funds tend to be higher risk, and generally with higher ongoing fees, would it be a sensible strategy to invest in lower risk growth funds and draw on the growth as income? Now, that's a great question. I think that lots of people are going to be asking that this year. But firstly, I disagree with your view that income funds tend to be high risk. It kind of still depends on where they're invested, whether they're high risk or not. 
But I think the issue to consider is that for many income funds, a stream of dividends could well be a bit smaller this year. So you know, is that going to cause a problem with you if you're reliant on investments for a certain amount of income to pay the bills? So the, I think the options are you could stay invested in, in the income funds that you've got and you might have any other savings to top up any shortfall that you might see in income from your investments. Uh, you could switch to a different dividend paying fund or funds uh, which might have more resilient assets from an income perspective. Or you might want to look at some of these investment trusts where they've got lots of revenue reserves to help sustain dividends during the hard times. Or, as you point out, you could sell some of your capital to generate an income. So Terry Smith from the Fundsmith asset management business says to focus on total return, which is dividends and capital gains. And he, he says, yeah, you should simply just sell a bit of your holding when you need a bit of income. Um, I think this this view tends to divide opinion. So you could say that's fine if your investment is rising in value, but if you're if it's falling, you don't really want to be selling chunks of your holding, particularly in, in sort of a deep falling market as we've just seen recently, because you would actually just be accelerating the reduction in the size of your your investment. Okay, so we've got a bit more time. I'll just take a question here. So uh, should I invest in lots of different funds or buy more shares or units in just a few funds, such as five or six different ones? Now, again, that's a really, really good question. So I think a good diversified portfolio should have risks spread across lots of different parts of the market. Owning five funds would give you the solid building blocks of a diversified portfolio. Um, so you might want to have a, a global equities fund, a UK one, a, a US equities one, an emerging markets one, and, and a bond fund. So there's five there. So once you've got those sort of building blocks set up, I would then consider about adding more funds that that might act. We, we call it this concept called satellite and core. So the core is your building blocks and adding ones that would act, act as a satellite, go around it. So th this might be ethical fund, or you might want to have a property one in there, or tech fund, or a healthcare fund. So perhaps something for a, a range of specific sectors, or, or maybe a certain theme or two. So I think 10 or 12 funds overall would give you really broad exposure. So just, just check that these funds haven't got overlapping holdings too much. I think if you bought a tech fund and a global fund, well, actually, if you look at that global fund, it might actually be full of lots of tech companies. So do you really need that tech fund as well? So um, just have a good hunt around and, and try and compare stuff. Of course, you want to also then consider, do you want a quality fund or do you want a value fund? So you do need to think about which styles you're happy to own as well. And I would think about trading costs has got to be a key consideration. So if you let's say you've only got £200 to invest a month, and if you were to be spreading that money equally across 10 funds, well, that's, you know, that's £20 going to each of those funds. But actually, you'd be paying £1.50 transaction fee per fund. So that's 7.5% you know, of each £20 investment. It didn't really make sense to spread your money so thinly when you take into account charges. So I think you'd probably be better off prioritising those core holdings. Um, put, say, £200, if that was what you you had available, into maybe just one or two of them, those five core funds each month. So want to alternate which funds get the new money over a three-month period and, and do that for a bit. You know, build build up a bigger size pot. And then once you, you've either got a big size pot or you've got more money to invest each month, then you could think about adding some of those satellite holdings on top. So if you if you want to invest in investment trusts and ETF, it's the same sort of approach, but just remember that the, the transaction fees to buy them would be a bit higher. So they're just under, they're, well, they're 9.95 a go um, on the higher sort of side of things, unless you do frequent um, trading where platforms will take it down a bit. You definitely don't want to be putting you know 20 pounds into uh, an investment trust when actually nearly half of that, um, equivalent half of that would be the fee. So. So I think, unfortunately, 
we have reached the end of my time to go through all these questions. Hopefully everything I've gone through today makes sense. Um, hopefully it is very helpful to you, um, gives you a flavour of how those four different investment styles work. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's great that we can um, incorporate them into actually, you know, there, there's a lot to talk about there. And you know, an hour's worth is hopefully just enough to um, hold your attention. So thank you so much for, for sticking with me. Um, just a final note that during the presentation, I did mention a few funds that I own personally, just, so just for full transparency, they are the Fundsmith Equity, the Even Load Income and the Global Income one, the Smithson and the Man GLG Undervalued Assets. So um, thank you ever so much for joining me and I wish you all the best with your investment journey. Thanks a lot.